We've been looking at the epistle of James, chapter 1, and we've seen how James is dealing with faith, genuine faith, and the works that it produces. And we saw him speaking about the testing of our faith in James chapter 1, verse 3, in relation to temptation. In the midst of temptation, we know whether our faith is genuine or not. If it's genuine, it produces endurance that finally makes us perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, verse 4. Then again, we are told about faith in relation to wisdom. We find ourselves in many situations in life where we lack wisdom. Then we are to ask God, who gives to all men generously, he gives without partiality, liberally, and without scolding, provided only that the man asks in faith. And we are also told in verse 7 that if a man does not ask in faith, he cannot receive anything from the Lord. This is the same thing that we see in Hebrews 11.6. Without faith it is impossible to please God. I wonder if we realize sufficiently the importance of faith in our lives. Some of the most tragic words concerning those to whom Jesus ministered is written in Matthew 13 and verse 58. Jesus did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. And when we get into eternity and look back over the history of the world, we shall discover that in many, many places among believers, those words would have to be written. Jesus could not do many mighty works for them because of their unbelief. Because they lacked faith, they received nothing from the Lord, however good they may have been in other ways. And so faith is essential. If faith is not there, we are called double-minded people, and it leads to instability in all our ways. Everything becomes unstable when we don't have faith. Like the man who built his house on sand, his whole house was unstable. It wasn't just a room here or there. The whole house collapsed because the whole house was unstable. Where we don't have genuine faith, every one of our ways becomes unstable. In verse 9 to 11, he speaks about brothers and sisters in the church who live at different social levels. This is an amazing thing that when people become Christians, God does not eradicate their social level. We find very clearly in Paul's epistles to the Ephesians, Colossians, and to Timothy, he speaks about masters and slaves. In the early church, in the church in the days of the apostles, there were masters and there were slaves together, the brothers and sisters in the same church. Philemon had a church meeting in his house, we read, and his own slave, Onesimus, became a part of that church. He did not change their social position. Philemon was still the master. Onesimus was still his slave. But in Christ, they were brothers. They had become one. And so God does not eradicate the social levels and distinctions when people come to the church. Does not Just like he does not eradicate other distinctions of race or culture or intelligence. There are still people of different intelligence levels and people of different cultures and people of different backgrounds and different social levels who are all to be made one in Christ. This is the wonderful thing that God does. Without eradicating these distinctions, he makes them one. So there's an essential difference between Christianity and communism. Christianity does not teach the eradication of social distinctions. He says here, but, verse 9, let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position, that is, in his high position in Christ. Here is a brother who may be a slave. He doesn't own property like some other brother in the assembly. Perhaps his circumstances are very humble. He earns very, very little, perhaps less than 10% of what that other brother earns. But let him glory in his high position in Christ. He doesn't have to feel small in the assembly because his social circumstances are so mean and his circumstances are so humble. No, he is to glory in his high position in Christ and walk with a dignity that's befitting the child of God, his heavenly Father. At the same time, James says, let the rich man, verse 10, glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass, he will pass away. Here is a rich man, perhaps, who has not really been converted, who thinks too much of himself, and thinks, perhaps, 
that God is going to accept him because of his high position. Let that rich man glory in the fact that he's going to be humbled one day and like the flowering grass he will pass away. It's possible for a man in high social circumstances to be in the church, but not if he maintains an attitude of superiority. That is the point. And this is related to faith too. As James will come to in James chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he speaks about holding your faith with an attitude of personal favoritism. For if a man comes to your assembly, James 2, verse 2, with a gold ring, dressed in fine clothes, and there comes in a man with poor and dirty clothes, you show partiality. No, he says. He says, if your faith is like that, that's not genuine. Real faith will make that man who is in high social circumstances to humble himself and accept his position as equal with that other brother who is from a much lower social level. And this is a message that is direly needed in the Christian church today. Very often you find in Christian churches today that those who have high social positions, maybe someone who's got a good job, a big job, with a good salary and a high position, he comes into a particular assembly and he's given a position of honor by the pastor or the leader. Very often he's easily made an elder merely because of his administrative ability or his financial standing or his intelligence or his sharpness or any of these things quite apart from his spirituality. And when a church moves in that direction, it moves out to the realm of faith. It moves into the realm of instability as a church. God's blessing can never be on a church where people are honored for their earthly position. For that church violates this law of faith. Faith involves that I believe more in those things that are eternal than in those things that are temporal. If I think that these earthly circumstances matter in the kingdom of God, then I'm not really one of faith. I don't have faith. If I have faith, then I believe it's only that which is spiritual, that which responds and corresponds to the divine nature, which is of value in God's kingdom. And all earthly distinctions have no place and if God has called you, dear friend, to any position of leadership in a Christian group or a Christian church, make sure that you don't act in unbelief. Make sure you don't act in disobedience to God's word by showing partiality to someone because he's rich, because he's got a big position, because he's got a good salary and perhaps pays his tithes regularly and therefore you're afraid of offending him. You cannot be a servant of Jesus Christ if you seek to please people. You are to preach what God's word says. You are to get up in your congregation and preach. Let the brother of humble circumstances, you slaves and you coolies and you who are in a low position, glory because of your high position in Christ. You've given your life to Christ. Then you are in a high position. Not that they are in a high position merely because of their poverty, but a brother of humble circumstances. In other words, he's become a brother. Notice the distinction in verse 9 and 10 of James 1 between a, a brother of humble circumstances and a man who is rich. He's not a brother. He hasn't come to the place of being a brother. He wants to be known not as a brother, but as a rich man. And no man can stay in the church and be known as a rich man. He must come to the place of being a brother. And so we are to preach, let the rich man glory in his humiliation. Because like the flowering grass, he'll pass away. Like the grass that's burnt up and perishes, so will he. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and its flower falls off. And the beauty of its appearance is destroyed, verse 11. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. The rich man is the man who wants to be known as a rich man, who lives for being a rich man, and his pursuits are essentially of this world. And even if he calls himself a Christian or a believer, if he lives pursuing the wealth of this world, he will fade away. But if he can humble himself and become just an ordinary brother, just like everyone else in the church, then there is hope of salvation for him. Not otherwise. Faith makes a difference and brings us down to the level of everybody else in the church of Jesus Christ.